allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. change uh, briefly before we get on to our comprehensive plan presentation. Uh, our planner, Mike Long, and I met with Terry Carroll today from Proper Extension, and we think this is important for the board to hear this. This is a time-sensitive issue as we move forward. Uh, and Michael, do you want to take it from there? And then we'll let uh, Mr. Carroll jump in when necessary. Sure. Well, I'm just going to stand here, but... Uh, Terry is uh, charged with helping um, communities throughout the whole southern tier region in terms of complying with the um, smart energy community programs. Uh, there's several pots of money that are available. Um, the big pots have been spoken for, but there's still a couple $50,000 pots available. So I think uh, when Terry met with us today, we looked at, at the, um, the process, and basically there's four decision points, or, or excuse me, four criteria that you need to fulfill in order to be eligible for the grant funds. And uh, I guess, it is, I don't know if you said it this way, but it's a race to the end. Whoever gets there first, the money's available. Um, they have smaller pots if you don't get to the $50,000 pot. So, um, we found that we've already had two of the four things already in compliance. So we're already off in the, on our uh, to the races that way. And we have two small other ones that we could do very quickly which is the reason that we kind of asked Terry to come tonight and talk a little bit to the board. So um, he's given us some draft resolutions that we could uh, look at for the next town board meeting. So we just wanted to bring you up to date on that. And Terry can talk a little bit about the process and how it works. But the first is just to um, have a unified solar permit application. Uh, several of the other towns around the area have already implemented this. Uh, we have the version now um, that we got the PDF version, and now we've got the Word version, so we can customize it to Lansing. And the other thing is establishing a benchmarking program where we look at the energy consumption in the town buildings, uh, anything over a thousand square feet, and we do that annually. So, again, since the town does not have really a lot of buildings between the town hall and you know a few other things, the highway department, so it's I think it's fairly easy for us to yeah. comply and. As Terry knows, we've, we've done a few other energy projects over the years and things, so I think we're in a good yeah. position. But why don't you talk a little bit about yeah. the program and how it works? Yeah, so, so as Mike said, the program is called Clean Energy Communities. It's a NYSERDA program, so the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Uh, I have worked for Cornell Cooperative Extension, but we have a grant from NYSERDA to administer this program in an eight-county region, and I work here in, in Tompkins County as well as Broome and Tioga County helping to promote municipalities to think about their energy choices and to hopefully eventually become what's called an energy or clean energy community. Uh, there's 10 different actions. If you accomplish four of the 10 actions, you become designated. So as Mike said, you guys have already accomplished essentially two of them. So your code enforcement officer went to a training a couple weeks ago in Syracuse and that counts for one of the action items. And then you were also a participant in the 2014 Solar Tompkins campaign. So that gives you credit for two actions right there. The last two are fairly simple. They're very popular actions among communities that I work with. They're the benchmarking and also the unified solar permit. I'll just say with the unified solar permit, this is a permit that's geared specifically towards residential installations. It has nothing to do with large scale solar or solar farms. It's just for people that want to put solar on their houses or in their yards. Uh, it doesn't supersede any of the town's authority. It's just a way so that if an installer is going from one town to the next, they know that they're going to be using the same permit in all of these towns. And the state saw it as a way to streamline the process and make it easier for people to get solar on their houses. Uh, the benchmarking resolution is actually something that we're really fond of at Cooperative Extension. It's probably our favorite action out of all of them. And essentially all you're doing is inputting your bills into what's called the EPA Portfolio Manager. It's a tool provided by the EPA, so the federal government provides it for anyone free of charge. We, I'll basically help whoever wants to do it for the town, whether it's the clerk or whether it's the, you know, the planner, whoever it ends up being. You know, we make some profiles of the town's building, 
and every time an energy bill comes in for the town, we just plug it into the system, and at the end of the year, you're just putting that online so that people in the town know how much energy the town is using. Um, it's a fantastic tool. It really does show you, it's, it gives you a bunch of different information. So it's not only telling you how much energy you're using, but it's also showing you how much money you're spending on that energy. And it allows you to really compare yourself to see, okay, our town barn is using this amount of energy. Compared to other town barns, we're using a lot more than others. So maybe we should find ways to become more energy efficient or you know, maybe our town hall is really efficient and so we don't have to worry about that for a few years. And the best part about it is if you're doing this year after year, you can start to see where, you know, five years, you know, your town hall is fantastic right now, but maybe in five years you start to see that a, a boiler, a furnace isn't working as well as it used to, and it starts to give you clues that maybe it's time to switch it out. So for us, it's just getting more information so that you can really make smart energy choices. Um, as Mike said, you know, this is a, a race to the finish. It's a, you know, the grants are available on a first come, first serve basis. There's seven grants left in our region, and our region is the eight county, what's called Regional Economic Development Council, so all of the southern tier. Um, those $50,000 grants that are still remaining, you know, as soon as you become designated, you're earmarked for it. And it's, you know, the $50,000 has to be used some, for something that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So popular projects that we've seen are things, you know, switching uh, streetlights to LEDs has been a really popular one here in Tompkins County. It's something that the city, the town of Ithaca are both looking at. Caroline is thinking about using their grant for that particular uh, application. Uh, other projects that have been popular, installing solar on a building, putting in heat pumps, uh, looking at an electric vehicle station. And there's also public-facing projects that we've seen. So some of the things that we've seen are towns deciding that they're going to give all of their citizens LED lights to help them switch from the, the compact fluorescents to LEDs, or to offer grants. You know, the city of Binghamton decided to, to use uh, the hundred or $250,000 that they got to provide grants to citizens to pr actually pursue clean energy projects in their own homes. So it's, there's a lot of different applications. You know, my job is to help you get designated, and then if you do get designated, to help you go through the grant process. And there's different criteria, obviously, for the grants to apply for. But you know, it, it's a fairly simple process. Uh, we have five other communities here in Tompkins County that are designated. Uh, there's 11 at this point across the southern tier. So, but we're expecting within the next you know month or two to have probably 20, 25 of them. It's really starting to take off. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. Yeah. Who's eligible? Is this towns or villages? Towns, village, county, okay. cities. Yep. Just municipalities. Mm -hmm. If you meet the bench, the uh, four criteria right away, yeah. and you ask for a grant, um, like how specific does the grant have to be? How detailed? I mean, that yeah, it's a great question. Be yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So once you become designated, once you become designated, you have a 90-day window to apply for a grant. And it has to be fairly specific. You can't just kind of say, oh, we want to make improvements to our building. They want to have a general idea of what you're going to do to your building, but they're not looking for you to have a contractor picked out. They're not looking for you to have you know, specifics all you know, already in place saying, okay, if we're going to do insulation to our building, we're going to do this installation, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. It's just more of a general idea with some specifics. I know it's a little bit. And you get three years to implement to it. And you have three years. So yeah, so the way the grants work is you have 90 days to submit the application. Six, once you get approved for that for that particular grant, you have six months to start work, and then you have three years to use the funding. So it doesn't have to be used right away. Is there a matching requirement? Excuse me? Is there a matching requirement? No, no matching requirement, 25% available up front. Yeah. What we find is that, uh, I believe my memory serves me right, there's six $50,000 grants, yeah. and then there's $105,000 grants. Yeah. Those 5000 can actually just get put back to the general fund. Yep. There's no requirements for that. Uh, the main thing is to shoot for the 50000 I think the other part that's already taken up with the $100,000 grants. Yeah. Um, for the 50000 I think there are things we can find here that we can use that money for. Once again, I want to have the board be aware of this because having had two of the four, um, I guess there was ten, but there's four of them that are actually more, of, more of obtainable. Uh, six of them are actually quite difficult to yeah. achieve. But having two of the four already done, I mean, and uh, in all fairness to Lynn Day, thank you for taking the initiative. Yeah. I mean, Terry's actually probably 
was, was kind of shocked that, well, we've we already done this, yes. We've already done this, yes. What about the boiler? We've done that. What about the roof? We've done that. So we're off to a great jump start here. Yeah. And I'd like to seriously address this in two weeks' time to get these resolutions moving. And then it's going to be a matter of if we're in the right place at the right time. As you know, that's how grants are sometimes. So once again, it wasn't on the agenda yesterday, but it is. I thought it was important that we have this discussion so that the board and the public are aware of this as we move forward in the next couple of weeks. The resolutions, we do have, I think that will be available to the, to the town board members um, probably tomorrow or the next day. Well, I've got a first draft I want Kai to take a look at. I just okay. got in the blanks. So. so as it comes across your emails, whatever, it won't be a, a, an OMG moment, okay? Uh, or worse. So having said that, I guess we're all good unless somebody else has more questions. And the last thing I'll say is if you have any questions, I'm right down the hill in cooperative extension. I'm happy to come up and answer anything and help out in any way possible. So. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, moving on to our scheduled agenda. The comprehensive plan presentation uh, by Joe Watmore. Are you going to use this? Yeah. All right, so we probably need to go that way then, right? If you want to look at it. Uh, yeah. That would be good. Um, so what should take from there? Mike, do you want to help me get this thing on? No, you can get it down. I'm taking a second. Thanks. You know how long I'm going to do it? Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, I'd like to start off with the objectives of uh, this presentation. Um, start off with what is a comprehensive plan? How does the town uh, use this document? Um, at the beginning of the comprehensive plan process, we have a professional survey conducted at town residents. We'll do a quick look at uh, the results of that survey. Lansing's last comprehensive plan was adopted in November 15th, 2006. This is largely the, count, the town's current plan. The agricultural plan was passed in August of 2015 and is technically an amendment to the 2006 comprehensive plan. Additionally, it will be part of the new comprehensive plan as well. The process to update the comprehensive plan has begun in 2012. A diverse group of Lansing residents worked on the plan until the fall of 2016 when they turned over a draft to the town board. The town board asked the planning board to review the draft. The planning board took almost a year to review the draft and made many changes and recommendations and current and recommended changes and recommended to the town board. The proposed plan we're looking at tonight is the draft that the planning board put together. The plan starts with demographics. Who lives in Lansing? What are going to be the future needs of a changing population? Next, it takes a broad look at what is the status of the major aspects of the community, recreation, housing, etc. And, uh, and the ultimate goal of the plan is to try to answer the question of where do we want to be in five to 10 years and what kind of roadmap will it take to get there? How does the town use this roadmap? The comprehensive plan is essentially the work plan for the town board. New York State law says, quote, all land use regulations must be in accordance with the comprehensive plan, unquote. A future land use map will guide the development of the new zoning. A comprehensive plan allows the town to look at the overall development of the town rather than just looking at a piecemeal. And it's much easier to defend zoning regulations that are based on a comprehensive plan. It also helps establish policies relating to the creation and enhancement of community assets. At the beginning of the process of revising the comprehensive plan, 
the town paid for a professional survey of the town and village residents. On one side of this, that's town and village, and the other side is town only. Um, on various issues important to the town. I'd like to start this by reviewing the highlights of where there's a real strong majority of residents who favored or disfavored a particular course of action. The bold headings at the top are the questions that the survey asked. The survey showed that about two-thirds of Lansing and residents do not want more heavy industry to come to Lansing. Nearly two-thirds of town residents want to see more development of recreational biking, hiking, walking trails. And this majority was even okay with their tax dollars funding part of this expense. Almost 90% of residents want incentives for tourism, including eco-tourism, agro-tourism, bed and breakfast, wine tourism. Not only is protection of scenic views and natural areas clearly very important to lands and residents, over 90% of the residents support such protection, but it's also clear the residents want the town board to take actions to protect them. Development of renewable energy sources, for example, solar and wind, is clearly important to lands and residents, with about three quarters of them favoring such development. Both plans have at their beginning demographic information about the town. The 2006 plan used census from the 2000 census. The proposed plan used uh, 2010 census data and an estimation of what those numbers would be like in 2015. There's a lot of overlap in the demographic charts in each plan, but the proposed plan adds several new topics, including racial demographics and level of education attainment. Lansing's population is still growing, but at a slower rate than in the past. One of the noticeable changes in the presentation of the statistics is the proposed plan no longer shows the surrounding town statistics for comparison. This makes it harder for us to see how we're doing compared to our neighbors. The proposed comprehensive plan no longer gives absolute numbers, which gives the reader a basis for understanding the significance of the percentage changes, but instead just gives the percentage change. This was dark, largely due to the American Community Survey's estimated numbers. We're currently looking at revising this part to include more than just percentages. The goal of this slide is not to memorize the different topics covered by each plan, but to see that both plans share many of the same goals and recommendations. The proposed comprehensive plan adds some important new topics, sustainability, economic development, tourism, it drops implementation of the comprehensive plan, which seems unwise given that New York State specifically recommends that the plan contain, quote, proposed ways to implement the goals and objectives of the various topics within the comprehensive plan. Other major changes in organization and the current comprehensive plan put goals and recommendations in the same chapter. The proposed plan tries to separate these into two parallel chapters. One of the problems with separating these is that existing conditions and considerations easily morph into the next section, goals and recommendations. Here are some examples from the existing conditions and considerations chapter of the proposed plan. As you can see, it's very difficult to keep those suggestions from creeping into descriptions of existing conditions. The proposed comprehensive plan includes a lot more professional maps. This is a tremendous improvement over the current comprehensive plan. The current 2006 comprehensive plan does not have a current land use map nor a future land use map. New York State wants the town to document, quote, the existing and proposed location and intensity of land uses in the comprehensive plan. While this can be done by a text, it's much more understandable in the form of maps. The 2003 zoning map has been informally used as the future land use map for the current comprehensive plan, but was not specifically adopted as part of the plan. The future land use map is not intended to depict current conditions. This is why the proposed comprehensive plan includes a giant use and land cover map. The proposed
most neutral land use maps splits the town into many more categories than the country zoning map does. I've noted comparable zoning districts in the list of the proposed future land use map categories for easy comparison. Those little parentheses afterwards that help you imagine back and forth. Many of the changes are splitting up current zoning areas into more specific. For example, L1 gets broken into lakeshore low density and lakeshore high density zones. Some of the changes are adding more categories that are not currently on our zoning map, like community, community facilities and recreation. We'll look at these in more detail in a minute. This is our current zoning map. It's on display over here, so you can look at it throughout the show. Um, it has not changed since 2003, though it should have been updated to reflect the addition of planned development areas that have been approved by the board. I want to spend a little time looking at the future land use map, as it is one of the most important parts of the plan. The future land use map establishes the official land use policy of our town and presents the goals and visions for the future that guides officials' decision making. making. Designations on this map do not restrict property owners in any way. Designations on this map restrict elected officials. Officials cannot enact zoning that is contrary to this map. Elected officials are not required to make any zoning changes based on this map, but any changes they make must be consistent with this map. And this map is available over on the side for people to look at through the presentation as well. Some of the changes on the map that have been controversial um, that dark blue section in the middle there, changing, expanding the commercial mixed use area along 34B and 34. Uh, switching Bell Station land back to Lakeshore low density, um, that's in the upper end of that corner. Um, changing the Finger Lakes Marina to commercial mixed use, the triangular lands on the corner of Trip Hammer and Hillcrest Road. Um, some of these are there's discussion of changing some of these. Again, the map is being displayed so you can see it. I want to turn to the details of how some of these areas differ from the current plan to the proposed plan. Lakeshore residential gets broken down into lakeshore low density and lakeshore high density. That's the blue along the lake. Um, commercial gets broken into commercial mixed use and residential mixed use moderate density. Industrial research gets changed to PDA, community facilities, commercial mixed use. Um, there's a change to the commercial mixed use district uh, in several places, 34, 134, along the marina. Um, changing the residential three zones to two zones. The 2006 comprehensive plan was focused on building a town center, and this was clearly reflected in the descriptive of the commercial area. The vision was to build a single dense area of commercial residential development. The 2017 proposed comprehensive plan is more descriptive of how areas have developed and giving guidance on how they should develop. This description tries to cover a diverse set of commercial areas, the proposed town center area, routes 34 and 34B, um, where there's strip malls currently, routes 34 and 34B, where there's more commercial mode development. Little vision for how these areas should develop differently than they are currently developing is given, nor is there any indication of which kind of development is appropriate in which parts of the district. Given the focus on what is currently in place, combined with the general nature of the descriptions, what the plan proposes in any of these kinds of commercial development uh, <coughs> is basically any of these kinds of development. In the Lakeshore District, the current uh, 2006 comprehensive plan focuses on protection of natural resources, erosion of steep slopes, and access to water and sewer. The 2017 proposed comprehensive plan splits this zone into two zones. The low density zone is for larger parcels along the lake, which are currently undeveloped. The intent was to encourage new development to focus on these larger parcels where septic systems would produce less runoff to uh, the lake. 
The high density zone consists of smaller parcels where most of the dense development currently exists. Septic systems are a concern due to soil conditions and limited size of the parcels. Nowhere in the section does it talk about the desirability of public access to the lake. Both the current and proposed comprehensive plans express a concern about minimizing environmental damage to natural resources. Neither specifically talks about how to protect them. Notably, noticeably missing from both is a discussion of maximum density for this environmentally sensitive area. The adoption of the agricultural plan in 2015 supersedes the agricultural sections of the 2006 comprehensive plan. The photo above up here is from the 2006 plan, but is really being replaced by the ag plan. The proposed comprehensive plan relies heavily on the ag plan passed in 2015 in this section. The proposed to split the agricultural district into two zones. The planning board described the difference as the pinkish zone, you can see it over here, um, Rural agriculture would be largely like our current rural agricultural zone, while the yellowish area would be more protective of agricultural uses by allowing fewer kinds of development. It's difficult to see this distinction in the text as both describe non agricultural development is desirable in the zone. Currently, South Lansing is either zone R1, single or two family or R2 and R3. R2 and R3 are mostly the same. The major difference is that R3 is a one acre per home and allowed, R2 allows for smaller lots depending on sewer availability. The proposed future land use map changes the three residential districts that we have on our current zoning map into two. R1 changes name to residential low density and R2 and R3 are largely combined into one category called mixed use, moderate density. Here the text differs greatly from the map. In the text, there are two descriptions provided for the combined area, residential mixed use, and residential moderate density. The new area, R2, moderate mixed use residential, is described as having related commercial uses, but nowhere does it describe related. Vague terms like mixed use housing, wide range of building types, medium-sized development blocks, etc., pepper this description, leaving the reader with no clear, clear picture of what is being desired. There's an appendix on, on form-based zoning that is a step towards describing this, but it's not integrated into the plan. There's some mention of conserving environmental features, waters, gullies, woods, wetlands, views, etc., which are highly desired according to the residential survey. While the document regularly refers to encouraging desired features such as affordable housing, senior housing, trails, energy conservation, etc., no specific recommendations are given as to how to achieve these goals. The proposed uh, comprehensive plan adds several appendices that are not in the current plan. The residential survey that we looked at earlier. Design Connect is a collaborative, student-run, multidisciplinary planning and designing organization at Cornell University. They use data from the Ithaca Tompkins County Transportation Council to explore short and long-term changes to the community's transportation system as different forces exert influence over time. Again, a study conducted by Cornell Design Connect in 2015. And I want to spend a few minutes talking, oh, sorry. Um, the plan is a guidance document for the town board. The plan provides detail on development and other pressures on farming, existing land use policies, farming resources and enterprises, along with recommendations to ensure a viable future for farming in the town of Lansing. Again, a study by Des Cornell Design and Connect in 2015. I want to spend a few minutes describing what form-based code is. Our current zoning is largely something called Euclidean zoning. Euclidean zoning is not, in fact, named after the eminent Greek mathematician, but rather after the village of Euclid, Ohio, where in 1926, Amber Realty Company challenged the constitutionality of local zoning codes. The Supreme Court upheld Euclid's code as a legitimate action on the state under the state's policing powers. Under Euclidean zoning, uses of the primary element that is regulated. 
housing in one area, shopping in another, manufacturing in yet another, etc. This has been criticized lately because when people sleep, work, and play in different parts of the community as part of their daily routine, then transportation becomes a major issue that needs to be dealt with. Form-based zoning regulates the development by focusing on the scale, design, and placement of the buildings, paying particular attention to the relationship with the street or other public spaces. Communities that implement form-based zone codes tend to believe that both the look and arrangements of the buildings more strongly define the community's character than the actual uses that take place within those buildings. Because they focus on the form influencing function, these codes tend to be employed to promote walkable, transit-friendly development and more compact settlement patterns. And Lansing would probably mostly be the T1 through T3 or 4, and the higher numbers you'll see more in the city. I want to do a quick review of some of the controversial changes between the Comprehensive Plan Update Committee's draft and the Planning Board's draft. The language had stated that not only residents want more trails and paths, but the federal government and New York State encouraged the development of the two was removed. The Planning Board added language that discouraged trails. Even in the goals section, established was replaced with considered. Think about trails rather than take steps to establish them. This is Lansing's comprehensive plan, yet the language that talked about what the town should do to make Lansing more sustainable was replaced with language about helping the county achieve this goal. Language about how important climate change was removed. Language about how Lansing can make change was replaced with language saying that Tompkins County was working on it. Next steps. The town board is reviewing the current uh, draft along with public comments. If the board decides to make some significant changes to the draft, we'll have to go through another 239 review, and the town board could choose to hold another public hearing, but is not required to. Then the town board would do a secret review, adopt the plan, and file with appropriate agencies. If the town board decides to adopt the plan as is, we go straight to the seeker review, and then um, as follows. <coughs> so that's my presentation, and we're open for questions and comments.
compared to this uh, current community, this current development, and the county saw that as a development density suggestion and thought that it was too high for uh, some of the areas. So it's not referred to in numbers, but there are some references in terms of kind of like this uh, area, kind of like that area. I haven't fully realized that the Bell Station had been sort of reorganized as a low density residential. And could you give us any idea of what went into that change, what, what that decision was based on? I don't know if you want me to try to answer that, but primarily the planning board, when they took a look at the proposed uh, version from the uh, committee, they said that currently right now on the zoning map, you'll notice that Bell Station is zoned two different zones. It's lakefront, lakeshore, and also rural agriculture. Yes. Um, the planning board's rationale was, why don't we leave it the same as it is currently now? You can always turn it into a park. If the state decided that they wanted to create a park there, they certainly would supersede anything the town would do. Um, I think the other thing too is there was some consideration about the assessment impacts. So if it's you know, zoned or called a public park, then all of a sudden you lose the tax revenue of it. And years ago when the town board was looking at this issue, that was one of the criteria that they wanted to maintain the, the value of the, of the land. You know, so that if, uh, in, if there was a power plant on it, it's worth this much. If there's walking trails on it, it's worth this much. So the planning board, when they were discussing it, looked at trying to just keep it the way it is for now. If a project came along, it certainly can be changed in the future. It doesn't seem to me that keeping it, that making it low, in, low density residential keeps it that way. Because if a developer went in there, then the whole thing, I remember a number of meetings with the Finger Lakes Land Trust. New York State is here talking about this a willingness to sort of come in here and also to seek alternatives to sort of a pay sort of for the things we couldn't get. But as soon as the residential goes in there for low density residential, the potential of really getting that large area of the last large area of undeveloped uh, shoreline into something that the state is willing to buy, Finger Lakes Land Trust was willing to help with. It seems to me you don't, you want to have this plan makes it ideas of what you're looking for. And it seems to me what you're looking for is not allowing any development along that last lakeshore unprotected area. Well, actually what the planning board did do was they added some additional language in the in the um, section part, I think it's on page 40 of the plan, where they actually expanded the discussion, talked about the possibilities of long-term somebody going ahead and doing it. But again, you have a, a willing owner who owns it right now, is it for sale? So far, everybody we've talked to said, no, it's not for sale, you know? So again, you're looking at something that might happen in five years or 20 years or 40 years or 50 years, you know? It's hard to, hard to put a timeline on it. Again, remember, the future land use map is not the zoning map. It's a descriptive of how the town wants the area to develop. And that's, that's a contentious area in this town as to whether it should develop as park land or whether it should develop as uh, low density housing. Right. One opinion that comes down very, very much on, on maintaining it for the potential. This New York State was interested. Uh, Finger Lakes Land Trust is willing to go ahead and, and sir, if we're all sitting by waiting to see what Bell Station wants to do with it, that's a little different than people approaching and trying to sort of say we really would like this to happen. I, mean, I, would I would be very much against any low residential. Uh, for the record, residential in that last stretch. Since our last, um, I think since our last presentation where the planning board had the chance to defend their suggestions, we have reached out to um, Eva Joel. Waiting, mm -hmm. waiting, mm -hmm. waiting. Yeah. In the meantime, the reality is, is that it can still be changed with a special use permit to recreational. Any of these uh, zones can be changed if it has to be. Uh, right now, I think, uh, I'm not going to speak for the planning board. We have a couple of members here from the planning board if they want to chime in. What my understanding is that you try to do such a wide lens presentation because if you do change the zoning and it is the decrease in value as you do with farmland, as you do with any land, they can sue for compensation. And do you really want to put the town in a vulnerable position to that when nothing really is at stake right now? Or do you want to wait and see and be prepared? Who sues for compensation? Um, you want to elaborate on that? <clears throat> if you change, if, for instance, if, I, if we go ahead and change your land for recreational, 
We all decide we want to add your land change. Your value drops. You can say, well, my, but my value is this amount. And we say, too bad. Farmer land does the same thing if the zoning gets changed. We had this serious discussion when we're looking at zoning changes for RA to ag land to where you put the definition there. Uh, do you limit what the, what the worth is? Um, the, that the party that's affected can sue for compensation and the liable party, which would be the town, will have to come up and compensate them. And rather than risk that, considering we still have all the options on the table, I'm of the belief that let's see where all this goes. We can have that discussion when, if Eva Drill ever gets back to us. We've reached out to Andy Zeb, we reached out to other people, and there's nothing. So have you, you know, do no harm. You know, wonderful ideas. What do you do with the ag land up there also? Because um, not all wooded area. Uh, what do you do with that land up there? Um, the, I think we're putting the cart before our horse sometimes with this. But once again, putting the town in a vulnerable position when really nothing is going to happen about this right now that we know of. But if we do something right for that, you're going to make the town vulnerable. And do you want to pay that? No. I, mean, I, I was thinking more that if people were continuing to work and encourage the state to come on board and continue to say that year after year that they're interested in buying it for this purpose, it might change the... the I'm open to that conversation if he would troll and look it back to us. I mean, you can ask Michael, we had that conference call. And it's like, okay, we'll wait. And you wait. Um, and I know this is, you know, people want that area for recreational. Okay. But there's nothing on there yet. So once again, the options are all there. You're not limiting what you can and cannot do by not doing anything. And I basically respect the vision and the experience of the planning board because I think they thought all this pretty thoroughly on that. When I asked them about that, that was the, the reason that they gave me. Well, and actually, one of the planning board members his job is to be the county assessor. And so he understands the valuation of all the properties. And actually, he's the one who brought it to the attention of the other members of the planning board that once you take an industrial zone land that's worth this much, and now you say it's only park, you can't build anything on it, the value just drops tremendously, so. I, I did make the same point you made earlier at another meeting and encouraged Ed to reach out to Iberdrola and mm -hmm. Michael and see if we could get some communication going to have a sense, you know, what, how much we should invest in this. I, I, I would like to respectively disagree, though, that if you change the zoning on something, it's considered a taking and you have to pay the property owner automatically. Um, that's simply not the case. You, it's a taking if you remove all uses. It's a taking if you try to tell the property owner they have to do something for you. But it's not a taking to change zoning because no, ca no town will be able to implement zoning because zoning by its very nature limits what you can do on your property. I'm simply stating what uh, Mr. Sumner said to us uh, when we had him at the Ag meeting and we, he reiterated it there when it came to farmland. And once again, do you really want to take that risk when you still have your options open by leaving it the way it is. Well, right now, we're just talking about future land use map, which is not a zoning change. That's true, Joe, but we're also having initially stated on page 40 in the, in the plan as it were. It's been there ever since this, is, uh, this discussion started. So I would not be opposed to, uh, a, if, if I were still seated, I would not be opposed to that being a recreation area. It's not a bad idea. It's a great idea, but at this point, there's no reason to change it. Well, the, re the reason is, is because it's a statement of what we would like. It's not a statement of we're doing something. It's a statement of this is the town saying to the state, for example, to the energy company, this is what we would like. We did that. We had bus tours there mm -hmm. and what, in 2013, mm -hmm. I believe. The, the town passed a resolution, which is still on the books. Mm -hmm. It's from 2013, I think it was December, and that stated our interest in that being a recreation area. It is still in the plan. I, I, it's in the plan. And, and, and all I, you want to do is put it on a map. Yeah. 
Um, we spent 45 minutes talking about this last time. <laughs> and we're still where we are. I would not want to spend another 45 minutes about the same situation when we can't even move forward on any of this. Right now, this is all hypothetical. Um, but once again, I think we've covered, this, this is my opinion, we've covered all the options. All the options are open. There was a few more comments from the audience. And, and that's fine. I'd like to move on to those. <clears throat> um, OK, you first, please. Uh, a couple of different things I'd like to talk about. But um, the first thing is, I didn't see anywhere in the comp plan um, a place where we talk about environmental hazards and threats to planting to quality of life to property values. Um, we've got a coal plant with big coal ash landfills that we should at least acknowledge exists and think about what are our options for any kind of long-term planning to deal with it um, if, if there's an attempt to walk away from it. Um, we have a, a harmful algae bloom crisis in all of the bigger lakes, which is due to nutrient overloading primarily coming off of Ag lands, uh, and probably going to be necessitating uh, wider riparian zone protections, changes in manure um, regulations, etc. We don't even mention it as an issue. And now, of course, we've got the uh, what's going on these days is the uh, lead contamination at the Madison Gun Club and another hazardous waste site um, that were that we need to acknowledge exists and that may be coming to the town's taxpayers and have to deal with in the future. So I, I think that the current plan ought to at least acknowledge some of the environmental hazards and threats that we face. And I don't know if he's ever even talked about it. Well, on page 43 is a section talking about some of the hazards facing the lake. And some of those industrial ones were in that list from the uh, planning group that put this first plan together, um, the planning board took out all the industrial hazards as part of their editing. Doesn't sound wise to me. Yes? I'm a little confused uh, about the difference between high density lakeshore property and low density or moderate density or whatever it is. Um, without numbers indicating what the densities are, can you give me an example of an existing area along the lakeshore that is considered to be low density and maybe one that is considered to be high density? Well, let me see if I can try to explain the concept that we had talked about. Actually, in the original Comprehensive Plan Committee, they agreed with this concept. Um, where there's existing, um, originally there were little huts and shacks that were along the waterfront. They're on 20,000 square foot areas, is what the town right now requires in terms of a minimum lot area. That's the entire L1 zone, which as you can see on the map on the left-hand side, is pretty much a 3,000 foot swath through the entire town. Okay. What we tried to do was to take where the existing small little camps are that are already there, we'll block them out as, as that's the high density waterfront. Mm -hmm. And then we can take the balance of that, and because of the sensitive nature of being that close to the lake, and all the ravines and other things, the steep slopes, Let's put a higher um, land area so that we could possibly use the 40,000 square foot area density that would be similar to a single family home. So they would be along the waterfront, but they would have a much bigger, larger land area, primarily because of the slopes, erosions, environmental concerns, but primarily also the septic systems. Um, the state right now is more mandating different things, especially along the waterfront. Um, the county health department now is mandating a replacement sand filter system, engineered systems for a lot of these properties. So you have to have a bigger lot in order to accommodate it. So that was the reason for breaking that into two zones. So we initially proposed that to the comprehensive plan committee. They agreed that was a good idea. The planning board thought it was a great idea. 
The only modification really that the planning board made to that initial concept was to, instead of having it as a foot delineation from the shore, use it as a bench elevation so that it was calculated a little bit differently. So that we could pick, I think it was 880 foot, that elevation. So anything below that is one zone, anything above it is another zone. So it's just a different way of designating it. What we're finding is that if you look down at Ladoga Park, you see that the Quaza Huts, the seasonal cottages, they have holding tanks. The houses now are bigger and they're year round. We see the trend also on Lansing Station Road, where some of these were smaller houses, they're now year round or making year round. We're also finding because of the access of water, that some of these smaller lots that couldn't have a septic and a well, because they didn't have 150 feet. A primary example of mine is Dale Baker's house. Before water came, there wasn't enough room to put a permanent resident there. So as they start to fill in, for a variety of different reasons, and one of them is infrastructure, and more people on Lansing Station Road want more water now, that's going to change. So how do you address that? And one of the reasons you address that is the situation. I mean, I get concerned sometimes in the spring melt where the septics are underwater. You can raise your house as high as you want. Hopefully some of these will have mounded, but that's a concern also. So I think we're trying to be proactive about this. And once again, to see where the trends are, see what's moving forward on this. And it seems as though that's becoming more and more evident that more and more people that have an area down by the lake, they want to make it permanent. Does that hopefully give you a little more clarity? Okay. Okay, we have this gentleman first here. Yeah, Justin. Um, so I just have a question. But I think it'll be pretty basic. It is, so I see a lot in the plan. Thanks, Joe, for the presentation, by the way. Um, we have our current conditions and what we hope to be doing in the future, the basic uh, draft, um, which did a good job ex explaining. Um, I think some in different sections of the plan pointed out the lack of just empirical data uh, and actual numbers. Um, regarding some of the, the uh, statistics of, of different land use levels a lot. Um, my question is, is there anything uh, that we can look at and, and have uh, an empirical sense of what we need uh, to grow and progress and be successful uh, in Lansing versus what we want? So we don't have conflicts between uh, when we do sit down and actually zone things that it's like we, we want more residences but we actually need more something else where the numbers or uh, the data that we have that tell us how to grow uh, actually point us in a different direction than what we need. So say we want as a town uh, trails or more scenic uh, uh, you know uh, recreational land right but we actually need more industry and the numbers would tell us that is there any chart or anything we have uh, that we can look at those and we can make a better decision uh, in another survey, something uh, that might come out in another couple of years uh, that surveys the, the town where residents can look and say, okay, here's what the data says. It says we need this. Now with that knowledge, it might influence how I answer these questions on the survey of what I think we want. Is there any uh, data like that that we have available to make better decisions going forward? Well, let me give you some reality. Um, we're already being proactive about that. We have a Pathways Master Plan Committee that Katrina is heading up that is going to look at where the connectivity will be. And you also have to understand that you have to have, this is a, a uh, partnership, that the people who have the land want to give it up. Once again, you have to request, not require. Right. You have to consider, not demand. Um, sometimes the language is very delicate. Sometimes if you ask, like we do with every time we meet with uh, uh, developers, we ask them, and it's been many, in many cases, they're very sensitive to that. We've also put in for a reserve fund up to $150,000, and we're getting $15,000 every year into that Pathways fund, reserve fund, to buy land 
that people have available. Because a lot of times, the dynamics are that the family farm is now being sold, the kids live in a different state, um, they don't want to maintain the farm, they want to sell it, it's a nice opportunity to make them an offer for a perimeter trail. Uh, so sometimes it's timely to do things of that nature. The other thing is, is water. Water will bring you density. We want, people tell me they want density, but they don't want it in their backyard. Well, we're, we're in a bit of a pickle here then, aren't we? Uh, we want industry, but indus what kind of industry do you want in New York State? What can New York State manufacture? Or are we feeding off of the larger employers, which are our, our colleges, our three different colleges that we have, between TC3, Ithaca College, and Cornell? Where do we do that? Mr. Luciani seems to have tapped into that upon a warning. Uh, he uses heat pumps. Uh, he tries to be environmentally friendly. He'll have trails there. Um, so that's an offshoot of that. But well, what about out here when some people call it sprawl and other people call it open spaces? Maybe they want two or three acres. So there's a delicate balance here. A uh, prime example is the Hillcrest area. That triangle, people didn't want anything put there. I reached out to Mr. Young, he says, okay, leave it alone. So you don't have any development on that area because you recognize there's a buffer to that. Some of the things we can implement now, we don't have to have a committee to form a committee to commit to a committee. We can move forward on it now. And at some point, we're going to have this paralysis through analysis where nothing is going to get done. And next thing you know, we're going to have to look at this again with some of these things I've been proactive to move forward on these things. Hillcrest area is a perfect example. Okay, leave it as a buffer as far as that goes. And Mr. Young will mow the area to, to keep it down. Uh, there's other areas where we try to address that also. This environmental committee, start it now. You don't have to wait for a comp plan. We have a water and sewer advisory board. You can have an advisory board for this. Sensitize me to, 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 to stuff I'm not aware of. I'm, I'm, I'm open to all the suggestions, how we can implement that. You know, you did the thing with the lead. We're trying to work that out now. I mean, if you do nothing and you're stuck with it, you do something, are you stuck with it? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, do you stop it and mitigate it? Well, who's going to mitigate it? Is, is, does it qualify for a super fund? Does it keep going and you put the, put the shop curtains there? I don't know. I've been down there, walked the whole area with the Rotten Gun Club. Okay, what's the answer to that? I'm open-minded if people have suggestions. But if you want to have an advisory committee, form it now. If you need something for it's under insurance, form it now. Okay, third time. Form it now. Let's have something in resolution at the next meeting if you want to start doing that. So all these things can be proactive right now. Um, where are we going with some of the main arteries? Some of the farmers feel that, oh my God, if you put a water line in, they'll be all over us. Well, we had those discussions, sometimes heated, at the ad committees, and I would gently point out to them that there was a, a water line that went all the way from here up to the power plant. If you use that theory, you should have wall-to-wall -wall people. You don't. So, and I, I, I respond to sure, like to respond <clears throat> sure, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to acknowledge that there has been some debate over validity of the survey. Um, it was technically valid, but you make a point if people have a prehistory to a conversation, they might answer something slightly differently in the sense of, yes, I'd love to have trails, but what percent do you want your taxes to go up one percent to do that? Do you have people that you live next door that might maybe have to move out of the state because they can't pay their taxes? So there are things we want, and we have to balance them with care for our entire town. Yes. So, yeah, by no means am I suggesting we hold back anything of what's going on. I'm just saying, for future reference, having the data available data. so that when the next survey comes out, we're have all the talent to make more informed decisions on how they answer those questions. I think that's, that's an excellent idea. That was what I was going I also want to comment to Gay's comment about lack of even acknowledging the risks in the town. And I think it's important in a comprehensive plan to acknowledge the types of industry and their benefits as well as their risks. Because in a good government, the town and the businesses work together to protect the community. And I think if we do that here, 
or the lead, that's a, you know, we're struggling with that, but it doesn't make sense to not mention it. This is something that the government should have in the comprehensive plan. We'll go back to, I guess we'll go around this. We're we'll back to Michael, and then we'll, we'll, we'll circle around back to you again in a moment. Yes, Michael. Two kinds of questions. First is, I would like to get an example using the, uh, what we be referred to as the town center land across from the ball fields. <coughs> in the previous plan, if I understand correctly, they were angling for wording and maps to encourage that kind of development. In the present era, if I understand it correctly, that particular land was assessed in different parcels and then put out to the highest bidder for proposals. So if one had a comprehensive plan that was a visionary document, would the process of using that land be different? So it's kind of a philosophical question regarding the old plan versus the present plan, and how would one develop that land with a visionary document? The, the, the comprehensive plan should not be looking at individual parcel level development. And that's where you get in trouble because if you start trying to do that, it's like you're drawing the entire new zoning map all at once. And it's too difficult for a community to draw an entire town's zoning map at once. So what you want to do is you want to describe what you want with that area. The current plan talks about that area as being commercial mixed use. Um, and in very general terms, that's what it wants. The question that we should be asking about the comprehensive plan, is that how we want that area of the town to develop? Because that's, this is what this document is saying, is how do we want that area of the town to develop? Right now the plan says commercial mixed use is what uh, we think it should develop. And the question back to the community as we present this plan to the community, is that what you want? So I don't know if my question got answered about if we had what we want, would we have made those proposals to the potential developer differently? But I'll let that sit. Well, I think, I think Mike, um, the comprehensive plan, the, the, original, the original thought or use of that area hasn't changed at all. Uh -huh. As far as what we want on the frontage, reverse frontage and such, that's been uh, an active plan for, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, as long as this comprehensive plan has been discussed. Okay. So, it, it, in, I'm sure I'm going to get corrected on things, but in my, in my eyes in that regard, it hasn't changed one bit. So the things we're doing there, the, the assessment we had was, was basically to say what pieces of land are most, uh, most useful for people to come in and, and give a, a request, or give, a, give us a request for I agree with Doug completely. And in the discussions about the types of proposals that came in, we referred to the comprehensive plan and even back to the 2010 planning committee when a huge number of community members came together and said they wanted mixed use housing, they wanted senior housing, they wanted to have a place where we were starting to focus on some living space with walkability. So I think we're I agree with that. One other thing I'll interject too is it wasn't put out for highest bidder. What it was was a request for proposals based on what you would do, what you would invest, would it be something the town is interested in. That's how we ended up with a, a housing project. We had a couple other projects. That, and again, it wasn't based on what the town could get for the land. It was what they were proposing to do it, what their level of investment was. That's helpful. Both those last two answers are helpful in terms of an example of how the plan informed town decision making. The second question is, I'm hearing going forward for the 2017, not 2018 plan, some disagreement about how to incorporate public feedback. We had public feedback in August, we had public feedback in December, we had some public feedback tonight. I'm not quite sure I'm getting how well the five members of, of the board make changes or keep the language that's before the board at the moment. We saw some strikeouts. We saw some changes. We had some conversation tonight. We had conversations before. How practically will it be evolved? Will it be vote by vote, sentence by sentence? Will the, I'm just curious as a former legislator, how do you move forward with 
getting your arms around these public comments and incorporating them, plus, of course, your own view of what planning board is offering you, et cetera. Because it's, a, as you say, it could be paralysis, or it could be uh, an engaged process that we march forward methodically through section by section, for instance. I don't see this going there in nine months. Um, we can talk about the timetable tonight, but at some point, we're still up to the, we haven't got the next phase, which is, in my opinion, the, the harder work. This was hard work, but the harder work is the land use, and nothing may change. Hillcrest may not change. It may be a good idea, but the timing may be wrong. Maybe in our 20 years. And I've told you this before, nothing is an action. Doing nothing and leaving it the way it is is an action. The other thing is that, at what point do you trust the other different boards that you have voted on, and do you allow them to do their work also? Do you allow them to use their training? I'm sorry? We don't vote for the planning board. But we do. Okay, we have to we have to basically when they apply, we have to approve that. So and the question I'm directing here the question I'm trying to direct here politely is that you're asking this question, how do we address this? And part of it is do you trust the judgment of the planning board and their training? Do you trust the judgment of the ZBA board? Do you tr or why why have any boards? Just have a town board. I mean, at some point, you have to let them weigh in also. They go to the training for this. And some of these people have done this for a few more years than perhaps we have been involved in politics or in government. And sometimes you have to trust their judgment. Personally, I think they have a wide lens, and they try to be as vaguely precise as possible. But in such a diverse town, it's not just cut and dry as it may be in another town where you just have one group of industry. So we don't go back. I hope we don't go back in our nine months. The other things we have to address here, I've stated this, uh, this will be the fourth month, we have another grant coming up, a half a million dollar project for Myers Park. We know that if the comp plan is not approved, we won't even qualify for that. Now granted, half of that will be government money, half of that will be in-kind donation. So do, where do we move forward and let the next process go without jeopardizing this project, or do we say, eh, whatever, we're more concerned with a guy, and what about Myers Park then? What about a, another bathroom? What about doing the pavilion that's falling down? What about redoing the marina so people can come in and actually have to, actually could go to the starboard side? Because they can't. And Doug can attest to how many times people have gone on the rocks with that one. Those are things that we like to do also. I like to do all these things, but at some point, you're gonna have to let go of this and let the next governing body come up with the next recommendations. Then we'll have more meetings. We'll have everything taped. Everybody can watch this again. We can have the feedback there because everything's being taped and it's on the website now. They can watch these meetings tomorrow or, or the next day if they want to, if they miss it tonight. And that's all part of it, getting back to your first question, how do you communicate to people? Well, we have much more accessibility with that. Also, I think you have email addresses up here. How many times have I asked, call me? At the first meeting we had way back when, the informational meeting, call me. I gave up my number, 592-6542, over and over again. So at some point, people have to be willing participants and say, okay, I'm concerned about this, this, and this. They reached out to me about the Hillcrest, look what happened. I think we've already <clears throat> considered some of the points of conflict and the, the board is in agreement that some areas should not be changed and but we haven't stated that publicly so i think we should spend some time in a working meeting at our next meeting with our proposals of specific changes and discuss it publicly and i think i don't have an interest in going on for another nine months but i do think some very specific compromises to language should be made to make it palatable to all parties, thank with you. respect. Thank you for that answer. I think it helps to have the, a working meeting might accomplish that particular answer. And I would reiterate again to Ed and the full board, 
I did suggest a citizen engagement committee so that not just this question, but on an ongoing basis is a way for feedback both directions to citizens. But Ed, Ed invited you, invited anybody, to start a committee. You don't have to wait for formal, really, approval. I mean, if you want it, tell us, and you can have it. I would really like to see an advisory committee on the environment. I would like to see some of the things they said addressed. I'd hate to think that we're just overlooking the ash piles, and especially the lead. Wasn't there a proposal to create a conservation advisory council? You know, many towns have them. Yeah, we discussed it at our last uh, joint meeting with the planning board. They also expressed support for it. Um, Ed suppressed, he said he was in support of it. You know, go ahead and start it. I think that we do need a conservation advisory board. We need interested people. If there's people here who might be interested. There's a lot on everybody's plate. So it really does take someone spearheading the effort and reaching out to people with a variety of perspectives. I think that's what makes it a, a very valuable board if it has a variety of perspectives to really discuss things in the round and then present advice to the board. I'll be coming to the next working session with some suggested changes. Go ahead. In the back. Melanie? Um, I, I noticed in the proposed future land use map, there, if I have it correctly, there is a proposed change making commercial mixed use from North Trickham 34 down past the schools all the way through to Myers Park. And I'm wondering what in a comprehensive plan, either in a survey or the language of the plan, what is supporting that, that change? That's my first question. My other two are just general statements. Is, is there a public health section on the comprehensive plan? Because I, I don't think I saw one that addresses all aspects of public health, like quality of life and maintaining our educational system at the high quality that it is, and how are we going to balance that with development? What innovative things can we do to support you know, our school system, which is amazing? Um, I know of other areas that do very well with commercial development and residential development, and then they can't support their school systems, and they end up cutting art classes and music classes, and the theater program gets cut, and then, you know, and it's just, it's, if this is going to be a long range plan, are either of those options, you know, those topics going to be mentioned? Either in this one or in the next comprehensive plan? Those are just general questions. Good questions. Well, if you want me to take a stab at some of that, yeah. primarily the area along the Route 34B corridor was something that the planning board's been looking at for the last 10 years. And they've been trying to encourage that type of mixed use development. And as you look at Lansing, Primarily it is mixed use. There's there are some neighborhoods that are all residential, but along the major corridors, um, it's mixed use. Primarily, what they're trying to do is to limit the amount of road access. Um, that's why they had proposed for the triangles, a limited access, trying to have reverse frontage on some things, tried to put it in place with the Dollar General project to try to just have them come in off the, the side street there. Uh, to try to minimize the impact off of Route 34. So partly it was trying to minimize some of those things. Um, and secondly, talk about the school system. I mean, there is some language in there. There's not a paragraph that's, or a section that's really meant for public health, but public health is a general known. I mean, you can't really, we've talked about the biggest thing about the school system is to try to stabilize the tax base. And one of the biggest drivers of that is really the, the power plant and the decreasing value of the malls as well as the power plant, which is why we've tried to encourage some infrastructure improvements for sewer and water so that we'll continue to con the growth in terms of development. Yeah, so I, I've read and just trying to increase my own knowledge, have seen public health sections and other comprehensive plans that address you know, clean air and water and public health in general. Um, the, the survey and some of the language in the comp plan seems to not correlate with the zoning change on Route 34 there from North Trip Heron down past Myers. So that you have language saying 
we want to protect scenic views and uh, people like living in a, a rural character. They want to maintain the rural character of the town. And then putting commercial mixed use on the scenic byway on the way to our town, uh, one of our major attractions. There's a lot of um, buildings that are vacant. And there's no mention of infill, like maybe utilizing those lots to you know, populate that with commercial use rather than putting this long, long strip there. If this is going to be a plan for five to 10 years, we want to grow that much in that area in that amount of time. Is that really prudent? So let me, let me try to address quality of health, of course. <coughs> I mean, you can say generically, um, can you legislate clean water? I think that's another department to do that. Can you put stuff in there to say, yes, do we like quality of life? I think part of that is mentioned with the pathways, is mentioned with a variety of other things. It's, it's mixed in in a variety of ways. There isn't one concrete, specific section that spells it out word for word. And maybe that's where it sometimes gets lost in the weeds, so to speak. There could be a specific section written that would also mention some of the risks of the industrial and you, can, and you can say that, I mean, you can put that section in if you want to reiterate what has been said in the other paragraphs is fine. Getting back to the other area that you're concerned about, once again, that is the strip coming up from the town probably to the Cargill area. Um, where the Cargill entrance is, that area you're talking about? On the map, it looks like it goes all the way past, the, it goes all the way to Salmon Creek Bridge and it stops there. Okay. But, you know. Well, you have you have a business that's been there since 1950 in a in, in a area of Jones Lake. Could stay there because it's kind of grandfathered in. Um, I'm just wondering what, what, what language is there that supports that. Well, I'm going to try to address this. Um, that business could be something else. If it stays the way it is, you might be looking at another pit stop. The pit stop is one across from Oaks Harbor. I think that's one of the right. buildings you want. Right. And yes, we're working with that owner to try to do something with that. You can't force him to do that because if we're allowed to force him, we're allowed to force you. And once again, we talked to him about, and he had to, re to remove the one building because it was a health hazard. And hopefully something will happen there that won't have to do that. The other thing is that the way it is zoned now, you can put apartments along there, like you have across from the school. Quite frankly, why would you want to build another house there and where it's on a, such a fast road for residential? I don't think you're going to do that. And if you leave that the way it is in that area, once again, like Hillcrest, you pretty much have left it alone, and it'll do what it'll probably do, which will be apartments, if anything, or might not. I think one of the reasons that they correct me if I'm wrong, that they made the strip at some point was some somebody had a justification that it was spot zoning if you had it stopped at a certain place and then you had some of the commercial down there where he is. So they just connected it. Exactly. Um, actually, this has been talked about, I know when Jonathan Cantor was here doing what I'm doing now, uh, about having a, a strip. But the another factor that was considered was the number of salt trucks that run up and down that street. You know, the traffic going to the school. You know, it's a very busy street. Um, we have enough residential in other areas. You know, the idea to fill it in with, with some appropriate mixed commercial residential uses seemed to be the, the answer. On the other hand, I'm not in support of that contiguous strip of mixed use commercial. I don't, I, I have mixed feelings. I, at first I thought it should not go past Portland Point Road. That's the logical. You have a problem with sight line, and then you have all the traffic to the school. Um, but there might be some reason to do it on the right side to break your hill, but no further. But definitely not the wooded strip down across from the school. And that would only be if there was a benefit to the town, say, something that didn't have too many driveways out onto the road and was a back use. Well, and that's part of the problem is you can have a house every 150 foot another driveway. Legally. Yeah, legally. If, the, if the state lets you, right? Yeah. Have, have I, I'd like to go back to your comment about the fact that it, the plan does not mention schools anywhere except in the demographic section where it talks about how many uh, school children there are. 
And I think it's kind of hard to describe our community's future and not mention the schools. I, I agree that though you know, public health is generally a county issue, not a town board issue, I, I think it's worthy discussing those issues here just to say these are, these are things that we're worried about. It goes back to what Katrina was saying is we have to talk about our, our assets and our liabilities to be able to form a plan and balance it out and say where do we go from here? What are our assets, what are our liabilities, and how we balance them? One thing I would uh, add to that is one of the reasons I've been so aggressive about trying to keep the uh, tax base up, even though we've been under tremendous pressure from the shops of Ithaca, from the power plant, is because of the schools. I mean, we're at $1.49,000. I'm not sounding smug about that, but that's a pretty good deal compared to other areas. But it's not about us alone. We're all in this together. All the five taxing entities, it'd be six, if you're talking about the village of Lansing, their, their tax rate, I think, just went up 10 more cents. Um, so now we're up to $1.40. So if you're in a village, you're basically paying $2.89 to live in Lansing. Not to mention what the schools are, or the county, or the library. But having said that, um, to try to protect the school as much as possible, I am not going to go into somebody else's backyard and tell them how to run their budgets. But one thing I will try to do is keep the tax base as healthy as possible so they have options. And you have good options when you have a healthy tax base. So I'm very sensitized to the school, very sensitized to the whole big picture here. And how we go forward to this, what kind of industry do we get in here? I've reached out to, to Chris Williams to open up an economic committee to find out what kind of businesses we can draw here. And right now it seems to be service industry right now. And how you have service industry, you have to have people. Like across the street, you have to have more people. Not to sound smug, but dentists need teeth. They're going to come to this area. You want a doctor here? Okay, well, <coughs> Dr. Schneider tried to be up here many years ago, didn't make it as a pediatrician. There wasn't enough people. Look at what's happened over at the uh, community care center, how that exploded in the last 20 years because of the technology. So I'm very sympathetic to your needs, to your concerns. And a lot of people come here for that reason, and when their kids graduate, they leave. Any other questions? Yes, Kate. Um, a couple things. I was concerned with the language when uh, this proposed agricultural zone and the language around that, I haven't looked at it in a while, but it seemed to me to impinge upon the rights of non-agricultural people living in that area. I know of um, too many people who are downwind of the large dairy capos and whose quality of life has been pretty much destroyed as well as their health damaged from all the hydrogen sulfide gas and the other poisons that uh, drift down on them from these really large dairy operations. So I want to make sure that we are not going to end up shushing them and impinging on their human rights in an effort to protect, you know, the industrial agriculture that is more the norm these days. I also wondered about what kind of integrative thinking went into looking at all the different kinds of goals that we have in the comp plan and seeing how they might come into conflict with each other and um, rule each other out, cancel each other out. There was a lot about um, survey data showing how everybody wanted to see all this nice agritourism and scenic views and, you know, having more wineries and having a lot of what's happening between um, Cayuga and Seneca Lakes with all the ecotourism and agritourism growth uh, jobs that's happening over there. And, well, but frankly, they don't have these, the huge CAFOs. So I, I just see that as a fundamental conflict of uh, if you're downwind, you know, of a big dairy operation, I don't see how any ecotourism business is going to be able to have a client, a customer base. Um, those two goals don't seem to mesh very well. Do you have a recommendation? Well, I ha I would wonder if there's, and, and I don't know all the details about where our, where everything is and where people might go, but I think that I didn't see any language that recognized that there would be this kind of conflict that, um, you know, people might say in a survey they'd like to see this, but what does it require in order to get that? 
Do you have any specific recommendations? For no, I don't because I'm busy with a lot of other things. That <laughs> one of my concerns, as I was to Thomas, is <coughs> um, property owners do have a lot of rights. And farmers have a lot of property and they have a lot of rights. And I may not live on a very big dairy farm. We have an organic dairy farm. And it's not one of the big ones and we don't have a cable. Um, but we chose that. And others chose to expand their farm and they have very big farms. They have thousands of cows and they have a cave. Okay, they have the right to do that. And I don't think that anybody in the town has the right to say to them, oh, no, 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 you can't expand your farm. You can't do that. Well, they own the land. And also farmers pay a lot of taxes and we do not get a lot of benefits back. We do not get, uh, we have very few public roads that go by our farm. Um, we don't have water, we don't have sewer. So we pay all these taxes. And there was a study a long time ago, Cornell did it, I'd say 15, 20 years ago, and it was done for the town of Lansing. And for every dollar that we paid in taxes, we got 27 cents worth of services. For every dollar non-farm people paid in taxes, especially, especially if they had sewer and water, they got a dollar 52 cent worth of services. And of course, people with kids, of course, get a lot. And, right? well, and uh, guess what our school taxes are. So it's like, I understand all the environmental stuff, and that's one reason we went organic because we had an epiphany <laughs> that what can we do to make the environment better, our cows healthier, and our own lungs and everything healthier. But so we had that, but that doesn't mean we have to say to everybody else, you must do that. Except when it comes to property rights. This is the same argument I had with everybody back when I pushed for the ban on burn parents back in the early 90s, which led to the statewide ban as people woke up to the fact of just how dangerous it was to be burning modern trash in our traditional work areas on the backyard. I, I would say to people that, sure, you might have the right to burn your trash. Just don't let any of it come over onto my property. Don't impinge my property rights and my ability to sit outside and breathe clean air. So to me, it's the same thing that a farmer can have a great big farm, but if he is polluting the water that goes to everybody else, well, of polluting the air, then he's impinging on other people's rights of and their property rights. That's absolutely right. So that has to be needs to be part of the equation. But also, some rights don't trump other rights. That, that the mall, which paved over farmland decades ago, contributes just as much pollution to the lake because of the runoff from the cars dripping in the gas that falls into the lake. Nobody talks about that. It's perfectly fine. There are. So that should be stopped too, and yeah. not just what the farmers do. But I agree with you 100%. And we have property right on Salmon Creek. Years ago, the cows went down, they drank out of Salmon Creek. That hasn't been allowed in 15 or 20 years. Why? Because when they drink out of the creek, they can poop in the creek. OK, so we had to stop it. And it bothers me that people can go for fun, shoot, and put lead into Salmon Creek. That bothers me. So I have to, but I, th I think we have to look at the rights that the people have because they own the land. And also, I don't think you really want farms not to exist because all of us like our ice cream and our cheese or our sweet corn or whatever. But and, and people aren't asking for that. People are asking for accountability for for these non-target effects. And clearly, now that the hat crisis is threatening drinking water across not just the Bigger Lakes region, but all over the world, um, obviously, everybody all over the world is going to have to get on top of nutrient voting. And these practices that we've adopted as normal, and now payments do them. And, and, and it's, a, it's a huge threat to the entire economy of the Baker Lakes region um, to have these um, algae blooms. Of course, I think that some of the environmental things you said and also that Joe highlighted that was sort of taken out, it should be put back in. 
we should be thinking about those things. There is a, a right to farm law, and also with the CAFOs, they are monitored. Voluntary best management practices. They are also, we at the Bolton Point, we monitor also the phosphorus levels. Um, and our ag meetings, I thought, were very productive that we had. Uh, Michael and I went to a lot of them. Joe came on board at the end once he got elected. And I think they do the best. Of course, we have a farmer here. I mean, she knows better than I. Um, that's not a perfect practice, but nothing is. And once again, it's easy to say what the problem is, what is the recommendation for the solution. I'm here to get results. I think we've already demonstrated we're sensitized to the public by the changes we've already made even before the comp plan got approved. So having said that, I welcome specific recommendations on how we want to mitigate these concerns. Any other questions? Sure, go ahead. Specific um, recommendations would be establishing like wide enough riparian zone conservation areas and preventing the, um, especially among the blacklands, the floodplains, to not let uh, manure get spread there because it's the, the first manure to go into the creek and down into the lake when we have these heavy storms. We can look at uh, what's called regenerative or restorative agriculture. So I can see it on those bottom lines. It would be tree crops and pasture with, you know, um, grazing that would, would really reduce the amount of nutrient runoff. There's a, 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 you know, there are people working on HABs. I'm part of that conversation that's statewide. And there are, um, you know, people are trying to come up with solutions. Recognizing that the voluntary best management practices have clearly not been enough because of the amount of um, harmful algae blooms that we're having and the, the um, backlog, so to speak, or the storage capacity of all the excess phosphorus and nutrient and uh, nitrogen that's already in the water, so it take a long time, maybe decades, to get that out of the system and stop having these uh, perturbations in the lakes. Could you send me some specific studies so I can look at that, please? Sure. Mm -hmm. And specific recommendations so we have a record so we can share with the board, please. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Going once? Going twice? Okay. Now, do we as a board want to discuss more of the comp plan tonight? We want to discuss this at our regular meeting. I think it'd be nice if we could send around some of our suggested changes via email before the meeting and just try to be concise about what we feel are the most important issues to come to terms with before we accept the plan. Now, now that I'm not working on a presentation, I'd like to start working on some suggested changes. Uh, Timetable, um, what would be a major change to trigger our 239? That is a good question. Got it. It, it, it wouldn't be the volume of the change, it would be the materiality of the change. Okay. So if you reordered, um, reordered the sections or teased out the different public health pieces to repeat them in their same section, you probably wouldn't have a material change. If the plan itself is going to materially change, mm -hmm. then county planning probably should have an opportunity to look at it once again, because that's what the, it's not mandated, they get their review, but if the plan is materially different than the plan they reviewed, they should review it again. It's just like subdivision. if you. Put a flat in front of them that's 12 lots and after it's a, after adjustments are made it's now eight in a different configuration with a different roadway plan they're supposed to look at whatever it is that's final or near final i don't think they need a full 30 days depending of course on the amount and number of the changes do you think in your opinion we can get something together so that we can pass it at our may second meeting 
Michael, does that give you enough time so we don't lose out on the other grant? I, I wouldn't go any later than that. But the other thing, too, is um, I want to remind the town board members that we put together packets of the last comments to try to comply with the 239 review. So um, we tried to send those out to you before the December meeting so that if you decided to, to get it adopted, those are the things that we need to incorporate into the changes as well. So take a look at those. That should be on the list to begin with. I mean, things like quality of life, I don't think those are real game changers as far as recognizing the fact of our schools and our children and our future and things of that nature. I don't think those would be trigger points. Well, let's ask Guy if they're trigger points, would it? Well, I don't know. I haven't talked to everybody, everybody but I'm say, say I'm looking at him when I say this every once in a while. If we were to add like a different section, say for health, that might be materially different enough to trigger. But we could elaborate within the other sections the general statement of description of the town, elaborate on the school and importance of supporting the quality of our schools. In industry, we could just tweak a little language, just acknowledge that in any industry there's risks and that best practice is for the town and the companies to work together to maintain vigilance and address anything that comes up. I mean, if you want to mention things like fly ash, which I think we've kind of had that mentioned, that, let me finish, we had that kind of mentioned generically, but not specifically. That opens the door to be a little more specific without triggering on our 239. Same thing with the, the lead. Same thing with, with, the phos with the concern about the phosphorus. Okay, that is a concern. Is that directly related to the algae bloom? I don't know. We've had that discussion at the at the Bolton Point also. Our phosphorus levels are down, by the way, not up. But that doesn't mean what was the cause of it. We don't know. But you can maybe mention something about these concerns that we like, that we like to address in a specifically generic way. If we do those and, once again, move this on to the hard part because these things any part of this can actually be changed once it gets going. If something happens like, like right out of left field, the rotten gun, okay? 24 months ago, that wasn't even discussed. Oh, some of us were. <laughs> All I'm saying is that it wasn't discussed publicly. It may have been once John, again. You were on the committee. You didn't bring it up then. The, um, <laughs> it may be also one of those things that another need for that conservation as advisory committee mm -hmm. to bring these things to the forefront ahead of time. So that you start working on these things not 17 months later, but maybe one month later. Well, also the fly ash is a DEC permit requirement, so the state is watching that. That's part of some of the things the planning board we're, we're talking about, you know. So there's other agencies that oversee some of the stuff. I don't think I don't think what we want to suggest is anything new or big, but just be more specific about certain areas and I don't know. I, I think I've heard a lot of public comment that might be significant changes okay. if we implement it. And yeah. Let's see if we can uh, get some uh, wording together because we could talk abstractly for the rest of the evening. Let's get some uh, some concrete ideas so people can read them, talk about them and discuss them at our next meeting. And if something is significant maybe you could run it by Mike and even the county planning up front. To All right, I think if we tell county planning that we'd really like to get this as quickly as possible, that they'd be considered on that. Okay. Uh, what about secret? Well, that, yeah, I mean, I didn't mean to be flippant, but no, you're talking you about something between one in a hundred changes that haven't been written or cited within the document yet. I have no idea what that will require. But we, we still haven't done secret review, and obviously until you know what the final plan is, and measure it as against the 2006 plan because you can talk about version 1, version 2, version 32, version 37, whatever you want, but what you're actually looking at is what did it say in 06 and what is it going to say in presumably 2018? What are the changes and is it a material, re material reordering of significant legislative or land use priorities? Uh, that is the key question that's going to trigger various levels of analysis under seeker and what's required according to 
council at DEC, since this is not a new plan and it's an update, we didn't even technically need to do a, a, a full EAF, which I think is, me personally, I think it's wrong. I think, I think unless it's a de minimis amendment, it should always get a, a, a solid deep look. So we did go with a full EAF. Um, there's approximately, I, Deb has copies, 30-something different maps and, and data points mapped concerning the initial EAF from October of 2017. Depending upon what changes are made, if those changes are site-specific, like they relate to a particular parcel or one or two parcels, which I understand we're not supposed to discuss, but which Bell Station specifically is, mm -hmm. then we may have to do more data mapping there or wherever changes are made. But the data maps aren't difficult. That's public information you're talking about. Um, you know, Chris databases, EAF databases, fish and wildlife mapping, um, what's been documented in terms of endangered species or significant natural communities. And you can tell in certain parts of the town you show up on maps because we're close enough to the Wyckoff Swamp and Dryden to have a lot of areas triggered in certain parts of our town. That doesn't really affect us, except someday maybe we'd want to categorize and recognize why the areas that feed that swamp are so important. So in terms of comprehensive planning, there might be changes that would require additional mapping. Until there's a near final plan, and I mean you're only correcting typos, you're still really not ready to do seeker. So timetable-wise, we have a serious discussion next meeting. Um, we're talking two weeks. But in all fairness, how many times do we have to listen to the Bell Station? We understand that's a concern. And, you know, I mean, some of these things, okay, have been said before. Um, and at some point, minor adjustments Hopefully we'll be enough to move this thing forward. So you're saying, if I understand you correctly, that when we're just about ready for the final, 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 that's when we do the seeker. You can't necessarily assess existing potential and probable environmental impacts until you have a solid understanding of what the near final plan will be. You can proceed in advance of that, and then if something changes, you can determine whether a supplemental review is required. Um, in, in, in EIS vernacular, they're known as you know, um, supplemental EISs. And the same process <coughs> exists for an EAF. You've seen that before, where Seeker asks you to begin the environmental review process as early as reasonably possible within any action. So that frequently means seeker starts very early and often doesn't close till near the very end. But there's a lot of situations for existence, for example, an existing site plan for a, a, a land development project, residential, whatever it is, where they go through the environmental review, uh, it, it's concluded, it's approved, and then they come back with a site plan change. Oh, we need to move this over 20 feet and we want a different sign here. And you don't have to do a completely new review, but you do have to look at what your prior determination was in your seeker and see if those impacts create any changes that now need to be re-examined. So you could go forward with seeker, but if it turns out you have to look at it again, you actually don't save time or money, of course. Guy, could you explain what a seeker is for the students? Um, Seeker is a New York State mandated uh, law. It's part of the environmental conservation law. It's principally implemented through a series of regulations. And if, if you've lived here long enough, you know New York State loves regulations. What it is is it's New York State's attempt to comply with the EPA mandate under the National Environmental Review Policy, which so Seeker stands for State Inquire State. Environmental Quality Review Act. And it mandates that all actions, um, there are some general exemptions to that. You don't have to look at everything. When you, when you open and close and schedule meetings is not a seeker issue, but, but define actions by governmental agencies and certain types of governmental bodies 
must examine both the actual anticipated and potential future environmental impacts of an action. And environmental, in the seeker sense, goes well beyond air, water, sunlight, things like that. It also looks at cultural impacts, tax impacts, impacts to obvious things like wildlife and less obvious things like how close are you to archaeologically sensitive area where we found an old graveyard or an old battlefield or something like that. So you have, there's different levels of review based upon what type of review it is. A whole bunch of things are exempt from review. The exempt list is about to triple in size because of the redundancy of environmental review with impact mitigation review under site planning and zoning. But for now, if it's classified as a type 1 action, it needs a full review. If it's classified as a type 2 action, it gets no review. And anything that's not specifically defined is called an unlisted action, which can get usually a shorter form review. And you have to answer a series of questions about potential environmental impacts. Some of them have 10 or 15 subparts. And most of that is done based upon an informational form and data mapping to understand what's on the ground in that area. I thought observing municipalities passing comp plans in the past, that it was pretty much a negative declaration because the plan isn't actually doing anything beyond the paper and ink it takes to print it. There is a school of thought that thinks thusly. But a comprehensive plan clearly has the potential to create environmental impacts. So for example, if your comprehensive plan said, you know, we like the old concept of mills. So we're going to actually encourage flour mills and wood mills and saw mills all along our creeks where there's a steep enough slope to actually use water as a source of power for a mill. I don't think that we could reasonably argue that that wouldn't have environmental impacts. Well, wouldn't it have the impact later when the mill was under planning board review? And I'm all in favor of reviewing something like that twice. You could also have economic impacts, environmental impacts, aesthetic impacts. There's a lot of different things to consider. So yeah, according to the DEC, pretty much it's universally accepted that the initial adoption of a major reordering of any land use priority, any resource allocation plan, it doesn't have to be land use. There's a lot of resources that government deals with the allocation of. The general rule under SEEKER is any new plan is generally a type one full review. And if it's a, like if it's a, if it's a complete, like if it's your first zoning ordinance ever, you have a very high probability of triggering a second level of environmental review called an environmental impact statement, which is a whole different ball of wax. When you're simply amending or updating a plan, according to, and I won't say specifically who, but one of the top regional attorneys for the DEC at the DEC regional offices, their position was, and it's because of a glitch, there's a lot of holes in SEEKER. It's very interpretive. It's, it's not perfect, even though it has laudable goals. There's actually a glitch in it because when you're simply updating a plan, at most they tend to recommend absent a material change in some of your priorities, that that be a unlisted action. And the last changes that they made in SEEKER actually had to do with how you use the, the long form and the short form for an environmental assessment, EAF, which is the first stage that you have to go through. And they were, I went to a training session both in this region and I went to a second DEC region because different regions interpret this stuff differently. And it's interesting to see how different, and it's because the state is not homogenous. What is an environmental impact in the Adirondacks is very different than what's an environmental impact in the Finger Lakes versus Erie County and Buffalo, right? So both had the same uniform message, and that is they wanted to strongly discourage absent a clearly articulated cause 
using the long form for unlisted because it was, it was creating redundancies and costs that were impairing the actual purpose and function of seeker. You can debate that, but when it's the, the, when it's the agency that writes the regulations telling you that that's the rule, I, I tend to give it some weight. I don't have to agree with them, but I'm not here to change the law. I'm here to advise about it. Um, so I, I disagreed with them insofar as I didn't think in a, a, a short form was appropriate for a comprehensive plan update. I, I, I think you want to take a closer look than that. So we're, you know, we did use the long form. Well, and especially and, with the level of detail that this plan has over the last plan, mm -hmm. there's a lot more information. And most of it's there to, quote unquote, protect the environment. It's to protect against adverse impact. And that's not necessarily a negative impact, but I guess it all depends where you get off the bus, doesn't it? Um, but I, I just, I just, I know the DEC said that you should use the short form, but I, I think when you're dealing with a comprehensive plan, I think that that is in and of itself, like a zoning change, in and of itself a valid basis to use the long form. I think it's important. So would you, just for scheduling purposes, do the seeker or seek from? Um, the night that we would attempt to pass the comp plan? Is that when it would be the appropriate time? Should you do it? You can do it. You have to do it before you approve it. You don't have to do it if you're not going to approve it. Um, and the only way you could approve it is if you concluded the seeker process. So concluding the seeker process would either require a negative declaration under an EAF or a positive finding statements under an EIS. So if you make a positive declaration of environmental impacts, you're not approving anything for, I agree. realistically, a year, maybe longer. But, but you really need the language changes of the current version of the document before you can determine what the impacts are. Get me to 98% and I can get your mapping and most of, most of the analysis done subject to what the board wants to say because they're the ones that make the decision on the review. But I don't. I'm not. I don't think we're at like 98% yet. We're still. There's still debate about adding whole new sections. So uh, until you at least have a handle on what the language is going to be, you know, if there's a general section on health, health and public safety type issues, I don't think that's going to require any seeker mapping. But if you're going to start changing where zones are drawn, then I think there are things that need to be looked at more closely. Will it in fact change anything? Don't know. Show me what it looks like and I'll give you an opinion. And then you can, as a board, agree with it or disagree with it. Well, do you want more meetings before this May deadline? Because if, if that's like, if you're not pushing this May deadline, I receive is going to be on the ground. I'm, I'm open to an extra meeting if we need it to get this to the May deadline. Mm -hmm. I mean, Wednesdays are there between now and the. <laughs> <laughs> Are we in agreement you don't want to miss this deadline? We're going to That's a good place to start. I think it would be tragic because <laughs> of the 20 people that are here, there's another 10,000 or whatever that aren't here. Right. And the, the hundreds that visit the park, there's not a guarantee that this would happen, but there's pretty well a guarantee that it won't happen if we don't meet. And this is according to our planner. We found out last time you were, what, 20 for 20 on the point schedule, but because the comp plan wasn't done, you failed. All right, we have a goal. Um, the, problem, the problem is the week of the 23rd is that we're going to be away at the uh, conference up at Lake George the first uh, couple of days of that week. Monday, Tuesday. Are you talking month. about which, which month, Josh? Planning. April. Planning. Okay. And Deb right. and I have our conference April 25th, so that Wednesday. Yeah, uh -huh. I've got another thing I'm doing up in Vermont the 25th and 26th, so. I'm not going to be around during that week. You available by email? Yes. Um, how about the 11th? Not my favorite choice. Um, What's that date? That's next Wednesday. Week from tomorrow. Gives you a week to. I don't know if I can get. I, it's going to take me. I, I want two weeks to like put some ideas on paper. Well, I know, but you're limiting us to your availability. I understand that. So. We, you know, we, we could meet on 
me and I mean, we've all read a lot of the comments. I think we could make decisions on some of the less controversial ones. You, you know, you start throwing these things on email right now. Right, let's throw them on email. Look at that. I mean, you know, and then, you know, obviously we would include Guy in the conversation yeah. because he would be yeah. one of the... Uh, I'd rather have plausible deniability, as they say. I mean, I think for, yeah, a thorough, obviously, you need two weeks, but mm -hmm. I think some of the stuff can be discussed. If I, I know, we already have a summation of most of the concerns that have been shared. Um, <laughs> you know, that have been shared tonight. Okay, those were ones that were re repeated before. And there were a few new ones, which was good. It's just a matter of how you, my, my whole thing is this, in general, is that you're trying to get a concept, and sometimes we get caught up on a specific. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, we're locked in that specific, whether it's a yes or a no, when really, we talk about land use when the, the, the concepts should be we support recreational area. Okay, you open that door for discussion. Where that goes from there is up to the next group to decide where the recreational area is. We support healthy land. Okay, we support not doing damage to the environment. Okay, you open up that discussion. Now you can start talking about all these specifics. But we get caught up in these, and we're just humans. I mean, this is how it is. We all want to do a good job. Uh, we get caught up in the specifics, and next thing you know, January turns into March, turns into May, turns into, the next thing you know, here we are again. Some of this stuff I think we can accomplish by not being so specific, but opening up the door for further discussion where everybody gets involved and say, okay, what about the fly ash? Is that something we should be concerned about, or is that monitored by the DEC? What about the, uh, the capos? Is that something we should be more concerned about or not? Should we set a precedent here about certain things? Those are things that can be discussed down the road and I think you get much further impact because what you've done is you've said, we support these. So you've already validated it, which I think is what you're trying to look for. Where you come with the specifics, we support these schools, we support whatever. Okay, how do we support them? That's where these groups come in. You're concerned about the environment? Once again, form that advisory committee and give us suggestions on specifics, how do you mitigate it? It's like someone says, I want to be happy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can, uh, for the sake of clarity, can I, can I just make clear that while you can debate the wisdom of one location or another for a council, <coughs> whether it's small or large, mm -hmm. municipalities, towns, I'll, I'll stick with towns and villages because that's what I know. Um, they're preempted from regulating CAFOs in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and even the state is preempted from certain types of regulations because the EPA regulates some of it. So, to your um, point, some of this, some of the discussion, and my point isn't to say that it wasn't a valid point or it's not something you should be concerned with. My point is that some of the discussion is getting into the zoning. Oh, I totally agree. And, and so I, I agree completely. I mean, if, if you all know anything about my personal hobbies and beliefs, you know I agree completely with <coughs> expanded riparian corridors. That's more so an overlay district type of issue. How do you protect? I mean, go farther. What about aquifer recharge areas? Well, there's other <coughs> areas that you can look at, but some of that is more zoning oriented, mm -hmm. and you got to get there first. Well, so would you have to just state your opinion. intent and then? The, the action is in the zoning discussion that I, I think if we generalize or open up the door to discussion showing that we that that we support these discussions prime example we we support the concern about farming it goes to the next board whatever that is they say you know Ed we looked into this you can't regulate this okay let's not spend two more meetings we just found out we can't do that move it on because we have other things we're concerned about also. That doesn't mean we're negligent. As somebody says, we've done our due diligence, we recognize these are concerns, give us some specific reasons why they are concerns and specific recommendations how to mitigate it. Yes, he's doing it. I'm just, yeah, I'm just, <clears throat> let's, I mean, I know I brought this up a couple other times, but it's really important to recognize that the document that has the word comprehensive plan on it is not the entire comprehensive plan of a town. A comprehensive plan is much more than that one document. 
what goes into a comprehensive plan is all sorts of policies and guidelines and rules that a town has. Um, so there are a great many towns that don't go to the nth level of detail discussing various aspects of community life. And, and it's for the board to determine what level of detail is appropriate for a comprehensive plan. But a lot of communities have separate recreational and parkland and trailway master plans or separate um, conservation uh, advisory <coughs> committees or, or boards and, and plans for that. So yeah, there is an ag plan and it will become part of our comprehensive plan. But even if it wasn't part of our comprehensive plan because it wasn't attached as an appendix to a document called a comprehensive plan, it's guess what? Part. It's still part of our comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan is, is just part of the picture. And I think sometimes people get too focused on the label it's given. Yes. If we call it master plan instead of comprehensive plan, people might be looking at it differently. Maybe in a better light, maybe in a worse light. I guess it depends on what the word master means to you versus comprehensive. And considering the anniversary that's being recognized these days, maybe that's a wrong word choice. But the, the concept's the same. Um, I, I don't want to have the vision that the comprehensive plan and what is the comprehensive vision of the future of Lansing, it can't be distilled into one document. And if it ever can be distilled into one document, then we're probably in a world better defined by the movie A Boy and His Dog. <laughs> I think you gave us some uh, vague clarity. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I wrote it down. Yeah, question. Vaguely precise as possible. Not a question, but so being here for my second time, I feel like I'm starting to understand a little better myself of the comprehensive plan versus the goals and the spirit of the town that I see moving forward. Okay, so. My first time coming here, I was falling for the whole idea of comprehensive planning is this grand thing, and this is what we're doing, and that. And now getting more of the picture of we need to get this comprehensive plan into the hands of the state uh, so they can evaluate it, so we can move forward attaining grants that can help us achieve all these other goals. So I feel like I uh, have learned a lot just being here the last few times. But I feel like one of the things that drove me to come here was feeling like I didn't necessarily know the proper venue to express my concern. So the, even though a lot of the things that are being said are different issues, the fact that I feel like there's now redundancy in the level of concern in each of my two meetings that I've been here, I feel like everybody brings this issue that they're concerned about because they feel like there's no other venue to discuss it, and they know there's a comprehensive plan meeting coming, and that sounds like the appropriate time and place to bring up whatever particular concern. So I'm, I'm starting to feel a little uh, uh, bogged down myself with just the level of there's concern after concern after concern, and the conference plan is not necessarily the place to detail that concern in that specificity that would be required to address it. So. Like I hear all, everything so far, I think they're like, yeah, there might be a word or two that just needs to be included to, to appease somebody feeling we didn't mention the schools, right? We didn't mention this. And so that we need a word or two to include that. But I honestly feel like the comprehensive plan to for it to achieve its goals is probably pretty well done the way it is. I do feel like communicating that to people that come in the door to let them know that, hey, this is the spirit of the of, of what Lansing is trying to achieve, but this meeting is about a planet, is not going to address those concerns. These concerns are going to be brought up at a different where we're going to have a, a venue for you to express your concern, and then we're going to try to address it by suggesting starting a committee. Or, hey, this is the meeting where we're going to welcome concrete. You have that concern? Give me the data. Give me the research. What do you want us to do about it? I honestly feel like people like myself, okay, I'm in this pile of them are getting confused between the, 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 the nuts and bolts of a comprehensive plan and what my concern is for the town. I think, um, it's, so, yeah. I think it's human nature that the specifics drive the concept, but really the concept ought to drive the specifics. And the concept is you have this wide range, and within that wide range you move it on, and then you work on the specifics, right. which are, and it's so nice to have a fresh set of eyes, we appreciate this because you get cross-eyed after reading this thing so many times. 
the fact is, okay, people come here with a specific concern, when it should be just the opposite. This is what the general concept is. From that, you open the door to address the specific concerns and get everything out in the open, research it, find out what you can and cannot do, and what are the reasonable recommendations that are obtainable and move forward. And I think that work is not done here, it's done down the road. Right. But ironically, the comp plan is designed also for grant applications, and ironically, we're at a point of crippling a grant application right. because of something that's supposed to feed it. Yeah. Yeah, so I think for me anyway, I would feel I would feel good about saying, okay, hey, this is a comp plan meeting. After this meeting gets gets through and everything goes through, the comp plan is passed, then we're going to and communicate this on the website or whatever, we're going to have meetings that, that are open to welcoming suggestions and specifics, and we're going to find out concrete ways of addressing it. So we can look at things like environmental, you know, issue by issue, code regulations and zoning and all that stuff that comes after the comp plan. Um, but I feel like uh, even even for me, then I could choose the meeting to go to that's going to deal with that specific, my centric view rather than just coming to every comprehensive plan meeting to throw another, you know, uh, uh, needle into the field, you know? So, one of the recommendations we can do is when you put it on the agenda for these meetings to give specific discussion areas. Or, yeah, I guess it's Or you say, oh, does this interest me? No, I'm not, I'm not a farmer. This doesn't interest <laughs> right, me. Right. But I'm interested in the South Bank because I live in the South or whatever. I'm not, I'm not minimizing one or the other. I'm simply saying right. that you look at what your interest is and maybe that's when you come to. Sure. Um, I don't know. I think, if anything, I hope we refocused on being widen that lens again. Well, I would simply say another way to look at it and try to get a handle on it is to recognize that the comprehensive plan is the beginning. Yeah. Not the end. Right. Right. Okay. But I think that's, that's the thing, like I said, I myself didn't know and didn't understand. So. Uh, but specifics matter. Right. So there's balance. Right. I'm going to use that line again. It's like, hey, it's the beginning, not the end. <laughs> no, it, 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 it guides it? your processes going forward. It doesn't determine where they end up. I agree. Thank you. I like your idea of having meetings like this aimed at specific topics to go in more detail. But this That's going to be for after the plan is adopted. You can really talk back <coughs> and get answers. So I appreciate Opening up this kind of discussion. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I don't think this is going to, like I said, it's going to get a little tighter as this yeah. thing gets approved and then you move on to more specifics because then it's up to, to zoning changes if they are changed. Um, and then it's up to another bunch of meetings and a bunch of us doing it again here with the recommendations. I mean, I think if anything we've kind of changed anything tonight, we've pretty well got most of the things on the table, but also the fact we recognize that this is a guide, it is a concept, it is the start. And I think we all want to do the, the right thing, whatever that is, but sometimes we get so yeah. so focused on one thing, we can't see the forest through the trees. Yes, Michael. Um, just to, to make you aware, I, you talked a little bit about schedules. The third week, I'm going to be out of town that entire week. And if Joe's going to be out of town the next week, I would suggest that we maybe meet on the 11th and try to get your initial, you know, list of, of changes get started. Knowing that there will be more yeah, so refining. And Chris, is there anything on the 11th here before? I can tell you that you can afford something. Is that good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's written down. Yeah, something's happened. Uh, coaches, meeting, team selection. Uh, Steve can, might be able to move that. Or we can go to, to the, the community building. building. Well, I think what we can do maybe is have Steve go to the community That's building. That's what I was just thinking. Uh, but I think we should continue with the spirit of starting. It. But if, if, the, if the town board members could get specific language of things they want to see change and then have some discussion about those, I think. That would be, you got a question? Or no, I was just going to forewarn you. The, the, the 11th, I have an Enfield town board meeting. But I don't think we need you at this meeting. This is just going to be a quick okay. discussion, and we're going to meet with you the next week anyway. Yes. 
We'll save I'm just saying that if, we'll if you intend to have me there, I may have a conflict at least with part of the time. Right, if you don't intend time. to have me there and Enfield says they don't need me either, then I'm going to enjoy a night off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, then, then please show up here. What time is your Enfield meeting? Um, it, it depends on what they have on their calendar. Sometimes I show up at 7, sometimes I show up at 7.30. Sometimes I don't have to show up at all. But usually, usually they have me show up between 7 and 8 because they reserve some of the, they get through regular business then if they have. We could do it earlier. Six? No. We could do it earlier. 5.30. But I also don't think we need guidance necessarily. Yeah. Because this is policy. This is, a, this is not, you know, This is a, yeah. What do we want? And then the next meeting we're going to discuss it some more. Yeah. And, and we can get input from guys that meeting. I don't think we need them. I agree. Okay. I hope you get the night out. I got my possible <laughs> deniability back. So we're going to have to get a, uh, a notice in the favor of the ASAP about the meeting next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we're going to do 11th at 6.30. Is that? 6.30. Um, that's workable. Unless you want to start earlier. Yeah. I heard. Earlier? That's what I heard. 6? 5.30? Yeah. 6? 6. 6 is okay. Yeah. yeah. 6. All right, so this is next Wednesday. Um, the rest of the stuff we can probably discuss later. Uh, yes. Katrina, you're, we talked about that earlier. Same thing. I'll send out some emails about the sick time. Um, we got to get that done, by the way. Yes. That's a, that's the priority yeah, other than the comp plan. So let me let me just next meeting. jump into this real quick about the actuary table. Mm -hmm. If this if this goes if this goes to 65, the actuary table almost becomes moot because you're not extending it past that. Mm -hmm. You're basically dividing the number of, of hours by how much they have left. Uh, the other thing that I would recommend is going back to the old percents of six and a half, whatever, to bump it up to where we want to go. Because if we use that two and a half percent increase every year, the next wave of people, which are going to come in about six years, you're not going to be at that level. We want to be at the maximum mm -hmm. levels of the 60, 40. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the fair thing for both. It's the compromise. Will allow you to use all your sick time credit, but but when you retire, it's this amount which is consistent. Um, I'll leave it at that. But once again, oh by the way, the actuary table will be done by the uh, by, we have a group doing that, which we pay for by the health consortium in the future. I mean, it's a guide, but once again, it doesn't really apply after 65. In the old days, it did. It was a very useful tool, but now it's, it's it has limited use. Mm -hmm on that. And sometimes it's just a simple math projection of the guy's got eight years, here's the amount of money, here's his salary rate. And sometimes they may not even use that amount up um, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And that's, you can't really do that projection because there's too many variables, but at least we'll give you a, a guide. My main thing is I'm very comfortable with using the entire sick leave credit if we get those percents up to where we, we intended in the first place. Okay? Yep. Doug, you're comfortable with so, almost as a move tonight. Can we move the resolution tonight? Do you want to? Yes. Yes, cool. thank you. Yes. I, I hope to have a resolution in front of me. I'd like to see it. Can you hear it? Or do you want to hear it? Okay, we can. I, I feel it? better than, you know. If it's written? If it's written, because then we don't have any confusion as we're doing. We're going to meet in, what, two weeks anyway? We'll pass it then. We'll pass it back. Okay. I just I, I feel better with something this complicated to have it in writing. Like I said, I want sure. everybody going in the same direction as possible. So okay. I don't think two weeks is gonna hurt, but I think two weeks is Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. If we're meeting next week, we could do it next week. We could do it next week. Yeah, yeah. Right. you get a resolution together in a week? Sure. What's it gonna say? Ugh. I'll talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> Does that mean you wanna move to adjourn? Yes. You don't have to Katrina. Okay, all in favor? All right. Okay, thank you all for coming.